Hello, welcome to Pop Talk. I'm Crystal here, and I have a really interesting topic that's totally up my alley. And this research goes back to wartime, and it touches on the woman's role and the position. And we're talking about U.S.-China relations, and we're talking about World War II. We're talking about the R and R during this time in many Asian countries, and uh, it's fascinating. So I have here Professor Zach Fredman. Associate Professor of History at Duke Kunshan University with me to talk about it. So welcome, welcome to my show. Thank you, Crystal. Uh, so I just want to say it was a pleasure to meet you at Duke. Um, in, in China, in context, we're talking about American uh, situations. And, and lo and behold, I stumble on your wonderful research that kind of lines up with my research and talking about, you know, wartime for me in context of Hawaii. But you're talking about um, wartime U.S. placement in several Asian uh, cities that really kind of make us think about the the backdrop and the system that supports this uh, sex industry, really, if you will. So why don't we start with you talking about and maybe kind of um, explaining what R and R really is and how that started, and we can go from there and maybe tap into several of your researches. Sure thing. Yeah. So I've got this new project and it's a history of the U.S. military's overseas rest and recreation or R&R program in the Vietnam War. And so I got into this project because I wrote my first book on the U.S. military presence in China during World War II and the Chinese Civil War. And so to me, what I found in that research, the most interesting angle was actually the gender angle to that project, because by about 1945, the U.S. military had really worn out its welcome in China during the Second World War. But the one issue that sparked, uh, that sparked a public backlash was resentment over sexual relations between American soldiers and Chinese women. And this continued to be a big problem for the Chinese government. Uh, in fact, in, after Japan's surrender in the fall of 1945, about 50,000 American Marines occupied China helping the Chinese Nationalist government under Chiang Kai-shek take control of formerly Japanese-occupied territories. And there continued to be this simmering resentment over a lot of issues related to the conduct of U.S. forces, vehicle accidents, violent crime, a lot of it caused by alcohol. But sexual relations were the most explosive issue. And this really culminated in a massive anti-American protest movement at the end of 1946, early 1947, when two intoxicated Marines raped a 19-year-old student from Peking University. And so within the next week, there were protests involving about half a million people wow. uh, in cities all across China, from Xinjiang all the way to Taiwan, demanding that U.S. forces leave. Was and this, so I... Uh, sorry, w was this news released um, internationally, or was this kind of a narrative that was supported within China? It was released internationally, but it, the way it was covered in the American press was that this was like, this was all, these were false allegations. This was a newspaper campaign against Americans by the communists. So it was, it was downplayed in the Western press, but it was a, it was a huge deal in China, in cities in China. And, uh, and so I got into, so I finished this project and what helped me, what, what got me into this R&R &R project was I was doing some research in Taiwan. Uh, related to another topic, just something I had to do for an academic journal about something in the 1930s. Uh -huh. But I was looking in these foreign ministry files, and I saw these files on on R and R during the Vietnam War, and I was glancing through it, and I saw that like the the whole thing uh, from the perspective of Chinese nationalist authorities who fled to Taiwan in 1949. And of course, Chiang Kai Shek still ruled Taiwan in the mid 1960s. Right. And that this R and R program was all about like providing Americans with with sexual access to local women's bodies, right. and particularly hy hygienic sexual access, so they wouldn't get venereal disease. Right. So it was controlled. It was very yeah. regulated. Yes. That's right. I was like, how I couldn't. I was like, wow. You know, this was the this issue of sexual relations was like a, it was an important factor in Chiang Kai Shek losing the Chinese Civil War in losing support for his government in urban areas. Like, what would make him participate in this kind of scheme then less than 20 years later? Right. So, so that was all the, the timing of that, because I know in your article, what was it called? Um, the U.S. military. I'm sorry, I don't want to read. I don't want to misread your title. But the date of the R&R &R in Taipei, as you had mentioned, 
is from 1965 to 1972, which is, like you said, quite much later than World War II time. And yet yeah. this whole kind of um, R&R recreation is consistently being supported by the military. Yeah, yeah but I, so I was just, yeah, I was so surprised that Chiang Kai-shek's government, given how much these issues of sexual relations had caused problems for him in an earlier period when he still controlled the mainland, what would make him willing to participate in a scheme like this? And the U.S. military also had a different attitude. I mean, during World War II, the official attitude was that the U.S. military didn't support prostitution, but, you know, they also shipped millions of condoms overseas. So, I mean, they were sort of, there was, there was, there was tacit approval, but by Vietnam, it had changed. And the idea then was to harness uh, access to women's bodies as a tool both both to boost morale for American soldiers, but also as kind of an engine of economic development. But this and is so, way back though, right? This is not, it doesn't happen at, during the Vietnam War. This happened even before World War II. The idea of a military utilizing this kind of comfort um, to boost morale situation to entice the soldiers and sailors to really kind of look forward to something in their miserable duty. Right, absolutely. I mean, this goes back there. The General Patton in, in the uh, European Theater of Operations in World War II has this famous quotation, like, a soldier who won't fuck won't fight. Wow. And so, I mean, there, there is this kind of attitude. But, it, but you go back to World War I, and yeah. the military has, like, basically the, a, an abstinence policy. And the idea is that all recreation should be wholesome recreation. And, you know, the, the groups like the YMCA are helping right. the military. Or the original R&R R &R that, right. Yeah. Yeah. Then that it's, but of course, in World War One, venereal disease is a massive problem. This effort's not that successful. There's this little bit of a shift in World War Two where there's still there the, the official policy is not to condone this, but people are allowing it to happen. And there's studies that have been done, including in my book. I, I actually look at the way that like a a U.S. military, like a base security officer in Kunming in the 1940s during World War Two, is actually running a brothel at an enlisted man's club. And you see similar things like this around the world. So there's not support from like hot brass, but other people are doing this. Right. And then, so I think the closest thing we get to R&R &R that occurs in the Vietnam is in the Korean War, soldiers mm -hmm. in Korea are coming back to, to Sasebo in Japan for R&R. &R. And of course, Japan, because they ran this system of comfort women right. during World War II to, to prepare for the American occupation, they set up this recreation amusement association. I, I think that's the name. Uh, where basically, you know, they are, are recruiting women to serve uh, and provide, provide sex work for American servicemen as a way to, like, protect what they so-called Japanese respectable women are but we really... We need to distinguish the comfort women from the type of uh, women for comfort in terms of the U.S. R&R, um, &R, right? Yep. These women were not forced to do this. Right. They're not forced to do this. I mean, I think there are a lot of times they're women by, by circumstances, there's not a whole lot of other options. But in places like, so, the, so in the R&R &R program in Vietnam, it involves a lot of countries. So it involves Singapore, Taiwan. Uh, it also involves Hong Kong, Malaysia, the Philippines. And so in some of these places, there was a pre-existing U.S. military presence. You know, you had soldiers deployed in Taiwan. You had a lot of soldiers deployed in, especially Air Force personnel, in Thailand. So already there had been, there was like a sex industry that had emerged to cater to these kind of soldiers. Right. But it really expanded during, as part of the R&R &R program. And like in the case of Taiwan in particular, it like became much more tightly controlled, involving both like personnel, disease control personnel from the U.S. were coming over. Uh, and then people in the local government. And so they're trying to confine it to specific areas and regulate it in a way where I feel like it doesn't uh, offend the nationalist sensibilities of local men. Do you think that the local Taiwanese knew this existed and they just kind of let it grow? Or was this something that kept was coded that they said that these soldiers are here to help protect the civilians? Um, these women are there, you know, just because, I mean, like, who started creating these different narratives where they say, oh, no, they're taking our women, they're raping our women, so we have to go and do, make these kind of, like, structures to, to protect or so-called... Um, well, yeah. 
yeah, I think it's important that you bring up this angle about rape because this is really central and it goes back, it ties into my curiosity over like why the Chinese government got uh, involved in this after the experience in World War II. And so the key thing, the real key difference was in World War II, the U.S. government had exclusive jurisdiction over all military personnel in China. So no matter what kind of crime a soldier committed, U.S. authorities had control over it. It was, it was tried in a U.S. military court or, you know, it was ignored. The big point was like the Chinese authorities couldn't do anything other than like protest and send requests to the Americans. So when the U.S. government was trying to pressure the Chinese nationalist government on Taiwan in the 60s to join this r and scheme, they held out for a while. And what they demanded was a status of forces agreement similar to what the United States had negotiated with Japan or with NATO allies in Europe. And this was having a clause that would give the, the government in Taipei jurisdiction in cases of particular interest. Uh, so these are cases of murder, rape, robbery. And so once the U.S. government agreed to this, then, you know, in a, in a case of rape, then Chinese authorities have control, have jurisdiction over the matter. So once that was done, that was what finally got the nationalist government to agree on this. But it was, you know, it was still fairly contentious. I think another motivation was economic. Right. Because of the pressures of the Vietnam War, Taiwan was going to finally lose its uh, financial support from the U.S. government, wow. uh, this economic aid. And so for many years, the Department of Commerce had been pressing the Taiwanese government to build up a tourist industry to cater to American military personnel. This is before the Vietnam War even. So it's to cater to troops stationed in Japan, in Guam, and other places. So what the did region. they do, basically? They offered them a, a choice of going to Taiwan, for example, for, what was it, five days of R&R? And what they were yeah, so once, to enjoy? Yeah, so once the R&R program actually opens up, how it works is basically any American soldier on a one-year tour of duty in South Vietnam is entitled to a one overseas r r trip for that year. And so it's five or I think it's six days in the case of Hawaii, because it's a little further away. And you have your choice of countries. And I think you could, you'd fill out a request of where you get to go. Okay. And you didn't always get your top choice. Okay. But uh, yeah, Taiwan was, was, was ended up being pretty popular. People saw it as a good value. Uh, and then Ty and in case of Taiwan, it was really centered around sex tourism. In places like Hong Kong, that existed. That was important. But you also had all this duty-free shopping. And there were other I things that used to when sell When I first it. moved to Hong Kong, there was still that building where they had, like, where the, the, the sail soldiers and sailors were able to go there to buy cheap magazines or U.S. products. It was just like a remnant. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. And the whole Susie Wong era is kind of, like, created off of that militarized kind of concept. But what I wanted to say before I forget is, um, you know, we talk about all this, and we, we also know that the orientalization of like the Asian female body has always been exacerbated through media, through films, but actually started during this time. Would you agree or what, you know, the word, how did it exacerbate the, the kind of the idea of the orientalized, sexualized female body from these situations? Yeah. I mean, I think it really, it, becomes a major factor, I mean, I think even before the Vietnam War. So there's a, there's a historian who teaches, I think he's at UC San Diego called Greg Daddis. And he recently published a book called Hope Vietnam. Whoa. And it's a study of all of these magazines that really like targeted boys, teenagers, after like World War II on through the 60s, uh, that really built up this idea of this, this history of World War II as like, you know, this as as American soldiers being heroes and being rewarded for their heroism through sex. And so soldiers going to Vietnam expected that. And then, of course, you know, you have these kind of orientalized ideas that exist as well. And you see some of that in World War Two. Yeah, I remember the soldiers going to China. The the only preparation they got was this pocket guide to China. And they have one section on women at the very beginning. And, you know, they have like this you know cartoon drawing of a woman. It looks very beautiful in a cheap how dress. And they talk about, you know, there might be Chinese women in cabarets who are used to like amusements, but, you know, traditional Chinese Oops. women yeah, are, are, are not like this and need to be very careful. But yeah, there, there is this kind of orientalization from very early on. Right. You also have the, you have this 
this racial angle connected to Chinese exclusion. You know, American soldiers going to Britain, going to Australia in World War II can marry local women. In China, they're not allowed to because up until 1943, uh, Chinese are deemed racially um, inferior and cannot become American citizens because of the Chinese Exclusion Act, stretching all the way back to 1882. So the military kind of makes it so that, you know, by policy, any sort of relationship uh, between an American soldier and a Chinese woman is, is a relationship between, you know, a prostitute and a client. So do you think that the narrative of the kind of the Asian woman as the prostitute was actually built up um, to kind of set these type of women away from the proper women, you know, to kind of, you know, create these binaries that whether whether you are the kind of the, the whore or the or the housewife, really, um, and, and how they use that and against um, the U.S. soldiers saying, hey, you are taking all our women or we're going to take you can use these women as so that you don't. Um, go and rape our good women, whatever. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the latter, right? And that's actually, it's interesting. I mean, this is the way the ROC government frames it as well, because there is, there is backlash. I mean, in Taiwan at this time, Taiwan's kind of undergoing its own cultural revitalization movement sort of as a response to the Cultural Revolution on the mainland, of course, that with a conservative angle. And so people are using that to protest this R&R program. And so the, the government, the newspapers writes things, well, yeah, I mean, these are like, look, let's be frank, you know, these are not the, the best of Taiwan or the best of America. You know, these are sort of our, our lower class people. And, you know, the, these are soldiers, you know, they're, they're young, uneducated guys, but they are fighting for our freedom. And so, you know, they, they need to be able to release steam, have something to boost their morale off of the battlefield. And if they do it here, it's confined to this one area with our sort of equivalent of these lower class women, then it's not going to have such a broader influence on society. All right. That's and great. yeah. Let me just fight. What do you think? I'm just going to ask you as a person, as a, as a male, as, a, as an American male, how do you feel about that? You know, if you were going to war, you were an 18 year old boy going out there and you don't know if you're going to survive this war, you know, ultimately sex might be on the top of your mind, right? Um, and do you think that the government should regulate this as opposed to having all these kind of uncontrolled um, situations where there is accusations of rape? And, you know, how much do you think that you, you agree or not agree with the way it's been systematically regulated on behalf of the military? I, mean, I think the, they, you know, the military has always had a, a hard time this issue, right? I mean, there's, there has always been this kind of association between military service and sex, but they've really shifted between World War I and Vietnam to like going, going from this kind of abstinence policy to a policy of, of militarized sex tourism. And I mean, I think one of the, it, you know, the, I think one of the challenges is in the military at this time, and even more towards the present day, you have this like rigidly kind of heterosexual martial culture uh, that really belittles women, uh, belittles homosexuals, mm. and it kind of it kind of makes it so soldiers feel like they have to act this way to be a man. Uh. And I mean, this this leads to all kinds of problems. I mean, in my in my book, I talk about even up to very recently in places like Okinawa. Uh, I mean, there's a tremendous amount of sex crime that occurs. I mean, but often, more often now, I think in the U.S. military, it's crimes committed by American soldiers against other American soldiers against female soldiers. Um, so, I mean, you do, but yeah, you do have these really kind of disproportionate rates of crime and sexual assault that, that soldiers are, are involved in. I think part of that is this way that they're a, a, acculturated into this kind of institution. Right. Well, do you think that, um, you know, they try to, you know, like the one case of this one, um, reckless soldier who happened to be intoxicated and had, um, you know, had a horrible kind of scandalous case and they blow that out of proportion to kind of create these narratives against the U.S. soldiers um, stationed there? Or do you think that it's legitimate that, you know, a lot of times from the Asian perspective, they're saying that, oh, all these kind of reckless, virile young soldiers are coming here and just going crazy with our women? Yeah, but I think the context really matters and the history really matters. And in Asia, like we've talked about, you have this, you have this history of racism, this history of Chinese exclusion. So local people, they don't see this as an isolated incident. They see this as the latest. 
in a long line of this kind of history of being treated uh, uh, as inferiors. Mm. And I really saw the difference in my in my first book on World War II when I compared reactions to, to some rape cases in the UK uh, with with what happened in China. And what was interesting was I saw that in the UK, the, the first time this happened, the media reaction was much more about, well, does this American military court-martial resemble like how it's portrayed in, in Hollywood movies? Huh. Whereas, of course, in China, you have an entirely different kind of context. But then even in Europe, too, it'd be, it became a big problem. And I think particularly in France. And in France, it was handled in a way where there was much more sensitivity on the part of the U.S. military towards local perceptions of the behavior of American soldiers. But then what they did is they really just, the, the U.S. military tried to blame it all on African-American servicemen. I was going to say, it's a very racialized aspect of it, too. I think in your one of your articles, didn't you say that there's a case where they actually targeted when they saw two African-American soldiers with some Asian women and they called them out or something? Absolutely, because this is uh, in, in China, Chiang Kai-shek uh, did not want any African-American soldiers to serve in China. You know, there's this kind of deep anti-Black racism that exists in China. If you look at a lot of the writing on eugenics and race by prominent Chinese intellectuals in the Republican period, it's they 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 really buy into these kind of racist narratives that people like Lothrop Stoddard or Madison Grant were writing in the United States about this hierarchy of races. The only difference is they see like the so-called yellow and so-called white race as equals and then the other races as inferiors. And so, yeah, I did talk about that because at, at one point, you know, this this became exposed in the in the American media by black journalists who had come to China and said, hey, why aren't there any black soldiers here? And so and this was especially an issue because the American military personnel in Burma, I mean, I think they were primarily African-American. And these are include people that are working in building the road, the Burma Road or the Lido Road that's connecting uh, India to China. It's finally completed in February 1945. So all of these truck drivers are, are black. Right. And so eventually Chiang Kai-shek, under pressure from the U.S. government, says, well, yeah, we'll all allow like, African-American truck drivers to come to China as far east as Kunming, but no further uh, than there. And yeah, there, you, you did, there was this idea like you had in France that was pushed by the U.S. military that African-American soldiers were like a particular danger to local women. And you saw this everywhere. I mean, you saw this like even in the Kachin state in northern Burma. So there is this kind of attitude uh, that is, I think, also encouraged by the U.S. military in the way that they target African-American soldiers for disproportionate punishment for sex right. crimes. Right. Scapegoating them so that they kind of have the narrative so that they can blame them. Um, to turn it, I know we only have a few minutes left. Time goes so fast talking about all this. But, you know, going back to the woman's body, why do you think that the woman's body has always been um, throughout history, kind of the, the pawn of these, these, these tensions between places, especially during war. What is it about sexuality that is actually the deeper reason for the um, tensions between countries? Yeah, that it becomes part of this patriarchal nationalist narrative. And so many national narratives are very patriarchal, but women's bodies come to symbolize sovereignty. Yeah. And so in the case of China, particularly in World War II, you have this violent backlash because, you know, Chinese feel humiliated uh, by American soldiers. And, you know, their taking of, of, of women's bodies comes to symbolize the loss of sovereignty to the U.S. military. And their own. So I think that's so that they're going to use that as an excuse, right, to create the right. larger narrative. Yeah, and then it, it's one thing, I mean, you see across the political spectrum, I mean, this is one thing that unites, like, hardcore conservatives in China with communists on the left. Yeah. You know, all this idea, you know, to, to, to regain our masculinity, our manhood, but then, like, put women in their proper place. But, you know, it, it plays out even today. I'm thinking about, like, interracial uh, relationships that I know, uh, particularly a lot of um, Asian women who are either married to, um, you know, American men, Western men, or um, there, there seems to be that also the same thing about the Chinese attitude, like, oh, if that Chinese girl goes and marries a Western guy, then, you know, she's sold herself short. You know, they're going to create these narratives because there is that, um, that the insecurity of, of reflecting on their own manhood 
which is, isn't the case, but they, they like to create that narrative. So I feel like it's still playing out today. And it's really interesting how inter yeah, I, relationships. I agree with you on that. Definitely. Yeah. You see that, especially in China living there, right? Yeah. I think I, I, I would still see that today. I think it has a, has a really long history. You know, I think people, and it, not just in China, but I think, you know, people like, you know, younger men who, who come to the United States as, as students and, you know, experience, you know, sexual frustration, feelings of inadequacy, and then that can fuel a kind of racialized resentment uh, against the Americans and, and nationalism. Right. But then what about, you know, the missing narratives? I mean, you do mention it in your, in your, your articles, too, that you recognize a lack of material uh, that raises the woman's voice on this, this situation. And what do we do with that? Because you know, the archives, the his, uh, historical productions, they don't have access perhaps to um, these women who had stories or perhaps they're not published or they're not heard. You know, what, what are your thoughts on that missing narrative and listening to how the women feel about this? Like maybe they really it, genuinely were attracted to that U.S. soldier or maybe, you know, they were forced into it because of a certain type of economic reason. You know, we don't really know. Yeah, I mean, this is why you just, yeah, on these kind of issues, you have to do really, really deep research. And it's a challenge because victims of sexual assault, people who had, you know, jobs considered humiliating, like being a sex worker, don't often leave any kind of written record. But I think you do, you do find things. I mean, you find things in, you know, in the example of the 1940s in, in China, I found stuff through like social affairs bureaus, police records. Uh, and the women's voices, you know, they were writing, particularly after World War II. There's a brief period of about a year after Japan's surrender in China where the press in Shanghai was like particularly free. And so you had some women writing there, both in Chinese publications, but some also even writing in U.S. military publications about their perspective and say, hey, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, for example, I can remember one in an American military publication of a woman who was like a secretary to work at a U.S. military base, went to English. She said, you know, I'm not, I'm not a prostitute. You know, it was, uh, you know, it was, it was, fun. It, it was, you know, these are right. other like young guys. It was fun to hang out with them. Yeah. And, uh, and then you see this too. There's, there's more, I think when you get into the post-war period, you do see more writing, you know, in Taiwan, there was like, uh, hmm. yeah, there was like a series of like, uh, it, like almost like a subgenre of fiction of these bar girl novels written you know that came after r and r to talk about this kind of thing uh and then there are people who've done more in-depth research in a lot of fields anthropologists who spent time in okinawa and looked at these relationships between local women and american soldiers that's really fascinating i think there's still a lot more work to do but you're kind of really onto something um i feel like your research is intriguing as well as important um again reminding people who are listening you know um, Professor Friedman is the author of The Tormented Alliance, American Servicemen and the Occupation of China, 1941 to 49. And I, I, I don't know, I want to call out your two articles that I read. Um, if you could just give us the titles again to remind people what your specific research was around. Yeah, so I wrote, so I, I published one article based off The Tormented Alliance, specifically looking at these issues of, of gender. And I think the title of that article was something like, uh, GIs and Jeep Girls, uh -huh. published in the Journal of Modern Chinese History, because Jeep Girls was this name that the Chinese media newspapers coined to describe the women who fraternized with American servicemen, right. because American soldiers drove around those U.S. military Jeeps. And then I published a, a book chapter about the r, r program just in Taipei, and I think the title was something like, you know, U.S. military's rest and recreation program in Taiwan during World War II. Or during, sorry, during the Vietnam War. Yeah. And that's published in an edited book uh, called Vietnam War and the Making of the Pacific World, the Vietnam War and the Pacific World, uh, edited by Brian Cuddy, C-U-D-D-Y, and Fred Logeval. And so that's out, I think, with University of North Carolina Press. And uh, yeah, I'm in the process of trying to do this whole story about the r, &R program, not just in Taiwan, but in all the other locations in Asia and Hawaii and also in Australia during right. the Vietnam War. And so that's in progress. I, I researched little bits of it, summer and winter, and, and when I'm not teaching, and hope to get that done in the next couple of years. Good luck. We look forward to seeing all that. And I, I really appreciate how you are 
entangling so many issues is, you know, the war is usually predominantly kind of just told from this very specific perspective. And even like recently on Netflix, there's this new show with World War II on the front line. So everything's just kind of like the obvious stuff. But then there's so much intricate, nuanced uh, material that re- that deals with the relationship between women and the racialized situations of the context to ethnic groups and how they group together or pit against each other in, in these backdrops of war. So really appreciate that. Thank you so much for sharing all your research. And hopefully we can talk about your other ones and Jeep Girls another time. That's thank you. Absolutely. There, Zach. Thank you again. And uh, hope to join us another time. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you.